Well, it's six o'clock. We only have 10 people on right now, and we've had uh, close to 60 register. So I'm just going to give maybe just a few more minutes for people to join, and then we'll get started probably around 6.03. Check, 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 checking audio for Naomi. I'm just going to give one more minute. I'm going to go ahead and get started. All right, well, welcome everyone to our draft plan workshop series on our key topics for HOCO by Design. I just want to let you know this meeting is being recorded. My name is Amy Gowan. I'm the director for planning and zoning. And tonight we will be presenting some of the emerging ideas and a draft future land use map that are under consideration for the general plan update HOCO by Design. The purpose of the meeting tonight is to hear your reactions to these ideas and I address any clarifying questions that you might have on the topics that we're about to present. For those of you who may be attending for the first time, the general plan is a document that establishes the county's vision for growth, development, and preservation for the next 20 years. It's been a long process. We actually started in July 2020, but we're close to releasing a draft plan to the public. One housekeeping item is um, if you have to use the chat box if you're having technical issues, if you have a clarifying question or if you don't have a working microphone and you would like for us to share a comment on your behalf then go ahead and type it in the uh, chat box and that those would be the functions that we're using the chat box for. Otherwise, when we get to the discussion portion, we'll be asking you to use the raise hand feature to be able to share your your comments as we proceed through the, the discussion and all feedback on the concepts presented tonight will be collected in a survey that's currently posted online. And we ask that you please share your official feedback through the survey mechanism, and that will be open, I believe, through this weekend, and then it will close. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Matt Newcaster. He is our consultant with City Explained um, to get started. Go for it. Great, Matt. thank you, Amy, and thank you. Yep. Thank you, Amy, and thank you all for joining today. We really look forward to speaking with you about a very important document and where we are in the process. So let's go ahead and just jump right in. Um, go to the next slide. All right, so where we are in our process, as Amy had mentioned, we started back in July of 2020. We've been going nonstop ever since. This, for those of you who are veterans of general plans within Howard County, might recognize this series of meetings as a new step in your process. 
Um, maybe unlike other plans you've been a part of, we're having this draft plan workshop series in order to just put some of the things that are going on in our minds out for comment and feedback, which will help us write the document. So literally you're helping shape the writing of the document now. Once we finish this effort, uh, we will then go back into a more traditional process where we'll release the plan for public comment uh, in the fall. Then we'll go and meet with planning board and then county council and go through the normal process you're probably used to. But this is a new event um, and we're really excited about it to be able to get some, some feedback from you while we're still writing the first draft. So for me, I have a, a call to action for you today and, and on this side of the the camera and the laptop. Um, it's about informing you of the emerging ideas, recommendations, things that are just going on. On your side of the camera, we want to make sure that you're active and provide a lot of feedback. And so we have a little bit of set the table type discussion up in the beginning, but this is really meant to be a conversation between everybody within the call. And so participation is is absolute. And the more you participate, the more you can shape the way the plan is written. So I just want to start out with a little bit of process for us and build a foundation so we're all on the on the same level. Those of you who've been part of prior, prior meetings with us have seen this slide. We use it often, but our approach has been to really engage the community early and often. We've been doing a lot of data and analysis that we'll be highlighting a little bit today. And then we're bringing our national perspective and even our regional perspectives of just how things are done differently or done in other places to see if any of those ideas stick and where those things kind of cross, you see in the middle of the graphic is where we're trying to write this plan. So in terms of community engagement, we've been, we started out very broad and we just had a lot of what we call sort of fingerprinting activities or getting to know the community, having you inform us and make us smarter as the project team. And then we moved into sort of a recruitment period where we had a planning advisory committee as well as three strategic advisory groups for the environment, for schools and for missing middle housing. And those folks, we had a program for them that we went through a series of meetings and had very uh, specific goals and action items to hit. And then ultimately we're going through the process now, which you see is the draft plan workshop series, as well as the plan adoption process uh, for which we will um, unveil the draft plan, take comments and then work through that up until final adoption. And really, since July of 2020, it's been nonstop, as I'd said earlier, and there's always something going on if you want to participate in our planning process. And just about every month we had something going on and whether it's been surveys that you responded to or, you know, bring your own question groups and forums that we've had. I think we're over 70 something meetings now that we've had formally for the general plan, but there's a lot going on and a lot of ways to get your fingerprints on this process. And so if you are a numbers person, you can see this just some of the numbers that are coming out so far. Um, we've gotten over 7,000 comments and that doesn't count um, this round of engagement we've been doing. Um, about 900 people have responded to different surveys that we've had. Uh, we've gotten about 1,500 people now who are on our project list. So we can keep you informed of what's going on. And those of you who read the roving radish or go to the local library or are opening your utility bills, you can see we're really trying to stay on your radar that way as well. In terms of doing our homework and sort of capturing existing conditions, emerging trends and other opportunities that might be available within the county. You may know that there's a physical assessment series that was done. This is on the project website, pocobydesign.com. We went over 400 pages of different things to learn, quick facts, good things to know, where the compass might be pointing on all these different topics that you see on the slide. We'd encourage you to read one of those documents if they're of interest. And then we've also done a lot of analysis on that data. Uh, we have what's called the Howard County Community Viz Model. It's a predictive forecasting tool that looks out into the future and looks at how much growth and where might occur, but as important, looks at what the impacts might be so we can prepare and uh, write policies and make recommendations around those impacts. There's a fiscal impact analysis that's been going concurrently with that work. And so they've been trading information in both directions. And as one thing updates, the other updates, so we can um, get good feedback and real-time feedback. There's a transportation assessment that was done uh, by some of the consultant team members in coordination and partnership with Office of Transportation at the county. We had another consultant team member who did an audit of Howard County's growth management tools that are in place today. 
and whether options might be out under under Maryland state law or even other ideas. Then we had a technical advisory group, which was a sounding board for us as the consultant team and the project team, and they were made up of department heads within Howard County. We've been bouncing ideas off of them for the entire process. So a few things to kind of unveil and talk about, and we'll start with this idea of an emerging vision. Uh, by no means a finished product, it's just kind of emer uh, immerse ourselves in the survey data and those kind of things. What makes Howard County a special place? We've been sort of just kicking this around and it will look different and we'll have more information around it even in the draft document. Um, but generally speaking, we're talking about how Howard County is welcome and inclusive, talking about all the different things we heard through surveys and conversations about schools and neighborhoods and open space and the whole list that's there. And this commitment to diversity and social conscious and equity and all of that as well in our opening paragraph. And then we turn to how growth um, might be managed going forward and talking about that it must retain and improve the unique and diverse community of Howard County, talking about promoting um, sustainable development, environmental stewardship, and also looking at that uh, supporting infrastructure. I couldn't go to a meeting without hearing about that, and which is great to keep it on our radar. And with that idea of kind of just swirling in our head, you know, one of our first challenges was the future land use map um, that Amy had mentioned as part of the content for this evening's discussion. We started with a growth choices workshop where we put just different options out there to react to and learn more about um, what might be happening within the county, where it might go. And we looked at things as, as like in letter A, which is just what happens if the stuff that's already been approved gets built. And B was the plan Howard 2030 plan. And what if you operationalize that to its full extent, get more specific on it. Item C talked about what if we brought growth into a tighter area and therefore be able to make transit and things like that more viable. And D was um, looking at all different growth features as well as expanding the plan service area boundary, which we'll talk about later this evening. So we had a lot of great feedback from that. Meetings just like this, we were we held, we had over 250 people uh, attend a virtual meeting with us and just have a discussion. We had 388 people take our survey with us. We had 536 people download our document and read it. And we got over 1600 comments that really started to shape where this uh, future land use map might go. And then we looked back to Plan Howard 2030. And when we did a critique of that, we heard a lot about uh, the value of the document, but that it was it may be a little vague or maybe wasn't specific enough or maybe left too much ambiguity that decisions needed to be made later down the process that we wished would have been made during the general plan. And so four challenges that we put our, ourselves under for HOCO by design is to be more equitable when we're making our decisions and writing the document, be more predictable, more sustainable, and even more achievable uh, as we write this. And that starts with this future land use map that you see. And so if you go to the next slide, you'll actually see a side by side comparison here. And on the left hand side is the map from Plan Howard 2030. And there are four place types that were used. And it's things like growth and revitalization to uh, established community. And you see as it goes through. And people were saying, that's good, but I, I had some more questions or I needed some more details or the like. And so on the right hand side, you see the future land use map and the level of detail we're using for HOCO by design with the intent of being more predictable. So the boundaries are more definitive, the type of uh, desirable development or conservation is more uh, deliberate, and that's what we're really trying to do this time around. We've also been using that HOCO, or that Howard County Community Viz model in the background. Um, and so while we dream up ideas, working with our planning advisory committee on this, as we dream up ideas, the computer was running in the background to say, well, when you change that color, you're talking about this many more dwelling units or this much more square footage or employment, these many more impacts. Um, so we were getting real-time feedback from an analytical perspective when we were creating the map. And so one of the things that we did take from Plan Howard 2030 was the emphasis on activity centers. And when you look at how much land is left to develop and where the opportunities might be, uh, looking now and what, how do you stay competitive into the future? The idea of activity centers is also emphasized within the HOCO by design general plan. And a lot of that's going to be redevelopment, which makes it a little bit of a different plan than maybe uh, plans in the past. 
Um, and we need to be more predictable on what redevelopment means, what it looks like, um, what processes it goes through. And you see these ideas about equality for housing or jobs or transportation and the like, these offer opportunities for that as well. And so you can see here we have we had place types in the old document, so now we're calling them character areas to make a clean break. Uh, but you can see we have so many more than you had in the Plan Howard 2030. And again, that's under the idea to try to be just more predictable and more specific about what we want. But what you see here is moving from left to right. You have on the left the least intensity and the least amount of change, and the area on the right the most amount of intensity or the most amount of change from what's there today. And it goes from rural to suburban to what you call walkable activity centers that you see on our right. And so when we applied those colors to the map, in many ways it was a translation because so much of Howard County is already built out. We were translating a lot of what's already on the ground. But there are uh, some very good opportunities that we're trying to write the plan around as well and really look forward to the next 20 years of Howard County. And we did this with our planning advisory committee. We met with them all summer, um, really went through some great ideas, got very specific on some locations and continue to get feedback uh, from them from a survey they did for us. So their fingerprints are still all over this, but there'll be a draft plan that kind of emerged from that process. Uh, the flume will be in the draft plan that comes out this uh, fall. And again, just to provide a little bit of perspective, you know, some people when I speak with them, they get frustrated because we're working on the general plan, but it only takes us so far in the process. There are succinct steps that go until you can fully implement some of these ideas. And so if you look on the left, that's my photo of the tulip field from a thousand feet in the air. And you can see we're in the general plan, we're generally trying to figure out the orientation of the colors, where they start and stop, how they work together. But when you go on the right hand side, you see, well, when you really want to get in and get some of these answers, you have to go into your zoning and land development regulations. So things like setbacks or landscaping requirements or absolute building heights or parking requirements, all that stuff lives in the zoning. We plant the seeds in the general plan for some new ideas, but it's really going to have to be the commitment all the way through the zoning process before some of these things could or would take hold. So I promised you a quick setup. That's what we're trying to do. So for the rest of this evening, we're going to have a conversation with you. And as we talked about in the opening, there are five topic areas um, that things seem to be swirling around in our head and a lot of information to present for feedback. We'd like your help on these topics specifically. And so I'm going to go through each of the topics. I'm going to tell you kind of what we heard, what we learned and where things seem to be heading. And then we have a poll question that we'll use just to start conversation. But really, then we want to just open it up and be able to talk a little bit about each of these five topics. But the first thing I want to do is just ask for a little bit of grace, because um, as I mentioned, this is a new step in the process. If you've done general plan updates before, where we're really just out there and exposing ourselves with new ideas and thinking. And I may tell you, I don't have it all, uh, all the details done yet. And that's honestly what it is because we don't have the draft plan written yet. It's literally a work in progress. And so we're hoping that. We have some some again, some leniency that we may not have all the answers this evening for some of these topics, but just getting your thoughts is going to help us write the document when you see it come out in the fall. All right, so the 1st topic is the rural West and maintaining character in the rural West. So. As I showed you earlier, 7000 comments, there's no way to show all of them, but just to show you kind of some representative things as they come out in the topic of the rural West. You can see that there's a lot of interest in preserving uh, the green and farming uh, in terms of and the open space and its environmental qualities. Uh, but if you look to the top right, you can see we also heard a lot about, well, you know, the West provides a lot of opportunity for housing potentially, especially coming out of the housing opportunities master plan. There was a lot of talk about what could go on in the West, maybe to help with the housing needs going 20 years and beyond. There was recognition that farming is real and it has a huge economic impact on the county. Um, always did and still does and always will. And so we've got to take that into account when we're looking at how farms work, um, what they need to thrive and survive going forward. Um, and then there was this idea, like you see in the lower left, which was kind of people had their cost benefit hat on and they were saying, well, if you do expand and pay for all this infrastructure, is it really worth it um, for the bang for the buck kind of thing? And so we had our, our numbers people in the group as well. 
So for this topic, we looked at four um, uh, critical areas. We looked at the potential expansion of a planned service area boundary, which I'll show you in a minute. We talked about different and new home options that could occur in the West. The viability of shared septic systems in the West. We did some research on that as well as protecting farms, farm activities and their supportive uses. So, first, with the planned service area boundary, some of you who may have been on our website recognize the cover in the top right part of the slide. Uh, we actually have a little bit of an education piece on this. If you want to learn in more detail, some of the things we talk about this evening. But we looked here, if you look at, at the county, you'll see a faint purple line that kind of goes from north to south and it's very organic in shape. Uh, that's what's called the planned service area boundary. And everything to the east has a, a different priority in terms of water and sewer infrastructure improvements, transportation improvements, whether the emphasis is on walking or biking and vehicles or whether it's just on vehicles. Everything to the west is considered the rural west. It is not in the planned service area boundary for water, sewer, it has different transportation solutions, those kind of things. So where this line lies within the county has a lot of impact on what happens to the land on either side of it. And so as part of this process, we heard about some specific areas to look at. And so you see those in red um, where they said, well, what if you were able to get service out there? What would that mean in terms of growth potential or economic potential? And so we looked at all of these different areas some very site specific, but the largest area you see there in the bottom was scenario D from the growth choices workshop, which is what happens if you make a major expansion to the plan service area boundary. So, at the same time, though, we were learning about, you know, desire and interest to move the plan service area boundary to the West. We also were recognizing that there's been a lot of effort made to keep the rural West rule. And so there's been $175 million spent in county investments under the land preservation program. It saved 23,000 acres of farmland. And there, through our studies, we've been able to find 3,000 more acres that could be eligible. So there's really a, um, a lot going on in this area. And so we went to our technical advisory group, as I told you, they were our sounding board, and we had them uh, work with us to think through this process. And, some of the feedback they gave us, they talked about the fact that if you do expand the line west, it will have a significant impact on the character. You don't move the line west and expect things to stay the same. You move them west to have change. And that might be in conflict with some of the successful ag pres programs that have been going on now for a very long time. Also, more specific items that were brought up were, you know, when you have more people on the roads and things and during the winter months, you have to add salt that could have impacts to water quality. Um, talking about the fact of the critical water drinking watersheds that you have and how some of that serves Montgomery County to the south. Increased traffic on rural roads and the roads that were not made to handle that kind of traffic in terms of its twists and turns. There's not a lot of right away out there, so it could be expensive to widen those roads. It might be hard to actually service something other than the automobile in the west, um, given some of those challenges. And transit service would be very hard, which is a an initiative that we've been talking about. And then to continue sort of what, what that group spoke with us, um, we talked about most of the policies now are geared towards the east within the planned service area boundary. And if you divert and expand the boundary, it diverts the funds, resources, and timing of making some of those improvements that have already been programmed and promised in the east. Uh, the cost benefit concerns is because there are some developments already out west. And so when you extend the line across something already developed, it's a cost without a lot of benefit. Or if you end up making those homeowners come onto that new system, it could be very expensive for them. Um, and then also there was no guarantee just because you extend infrastructure that you would have affordable housing. There'd have to be several other policies created and rules put in place to achieve that objective. We also spent a lot of time, again, on the on the farm issue and the farm topic. Um, and you can see here, this is just evolving kind of um, descriptions and things we have, which is to start out with our first sentence of descri describing and defining what makes a farm activity. The fact that the primary owner um, may live on the site and has outbuildings that go with it. Then we talk about the fact that they could be in an easement, but they also could not be in an easement. Um, and then some of the more ancillary uses or supportive uses that might need to go along with farming as those uh, practices evolve over time.
Now, we did also look at this viability of shared septic, and we did this through an interview process. Uh, we spoke with the state health department, and basically the takeaway is the technology is there. It's possible it can be replicated. Um, it's being used throughout the country in certain instances and applications. However, there are a lot of obstacles that could still be in the way. One is who owns that system, um, whether it's a homeowner association, a third party, does the county have to own that? I mean, there's a lot of questions on ownership because with ownership comes the responsibility of maintenance and eventually replacement. Um, and the one thing that we sort of did learn is that all of these things do fail at some point, um, just when they fail and when they have to have major investment made. So there's a lot of costs that are, are out there. It's just who's gonna pay for them and do them. And then again, the fourth item that we had were different home options. And so this shows the idea of the interest that we've, we've had some interest in our conversations of people saying, you know, what about some of those missing middle housing categories, which are like duplexes, triplexes, uh, four homes with it or four units within the same home. Also, we've talked about accessory dwelling units a little bit, um, but it's like, well, what on what terms can that happen in the West? And so you see on the left were some drawings that we've done of how you can have a multi unit home, but have it look like a larger home that that are uh, observed within the rural West. Or on the right, it's just an idea. We actually had that in Londonderry, New Hampshire, but it's, you know, it looks like a farm compound, but it's actually a multifamily uh, living unit that you see. You can have duplexes and quads and stacked and the chicken coops where you park your cars and those kind of things. And so you can use design uh, to reach your objectives and really make sure that the character is maintained. So with all that that we heard in the study that we've done, we had five ideas that are sort of emerging right now. One is to develop rural living and rural crossroad character areas, which are the, some of those colors from the future land use map I showed you. Actually has specific ones just for the rural west that will allow us to be very specific about what some of the needs are, whether it's uh, residential or agriculture within that part of the county. Number two, maintain the existing plan service area boundary as it is today. So that purple line that we showed you with two exceptions. One is um, just north of the current administrative offices for the school system. They own some additional land, which potentially in the future could be used as a school site. And also we know there's some conversations going on just west of the Maple Lawn West project. Um, and there's some options there. Um, if, if you want to expand the plan service area boundary, it makes sense from a water sewer extension in terms of the distance. It has some transportation infrastructure. So if there's, inter if there's interest, that's the best place to do it. Number three, pursue solutions for shared septic technologies that could accommodate small scale developments uh, and opportunities for employment and limited residential choices. Number four, encourage and explore options to increase the type and number of home choices in the rural West. But if you do that, really focus on the design, compatibility, the architecture, um, so that those fit in well within the rural West. And then number five, maintain a strong agricultural economy and provide opportunities for farms to boost their economic opportunity while considering farm and residential conflicts. So we have a poll question now that we're gonna bring up. Perfect. And we have 45 seconds to basically say, do you strongly agree with those things I just said? All the way down to strongly oppose those things that I just said. And again, just your initial gut reaction. You'll be a formal survey afterwards to take, um, but just give us this so we can have a conversation about these five topics. All right, last five seconds, five, four, three, two, one, time. All right, and while I was speaking, I didn't check how many people are in, so, are in the actual event. So the 17 that you see no answer, a lot of those might be uh, part of the project team, but again, how many are in here, Brian? I don't even know. We have 27. Yes. Okay, so a large percentage over half 
chose either not to answer or we've had some a little bit of difficulty just on our first question, but let's just open it up for everybody to react to. Um, those of you who strongly support some of these ideas, why don't you go ahead and speak? But we're gonna have we're gonna give everybody a chance to comment on these. All right, so if you can raise your hand if you would like to speak as a strong supporter or you can enter uh, your comment in the chat box and we can call on you from there. Not seeing any hands raised at this point. How about Frank Hecker? Frank, one moment, let me take you off mute. Are you okay? Frank, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, Frank. Yep. Great. Yeah, so I, I voted strongly support on this. Um, and and the, the basic reason is because I think it's a politically realistic approach. Um, the I don't think developing the West from a from you know from an intense development perspective is really going to, be, going to be economically possible or politically possible. So I think this is probably the best approach within that, within that, um, uh, within that, within those boundaries. Um, the one thing I will say is that uh, I am very concerned that there are people who would like to live, live in the West, in West Howard, and um, there's good reason for them to live in West Howard. Like they, maybe, maybe they work on farms or in local businesses or whatever. But I'm very concerned they're going to be priced out, and that Western Highway is basically going to be a become a neighborhood of or an area of basically million dollar plus houses plus maybe a few existing farmhouses that that are you know on farms. So I am very interested in looking at the solutions for missing middle high housing, duplexes and things like that that would that would accommodate folks that aren't able to afford you know one million two million dollar houses. But other than that, other than that, I like. I like this approach. I think it's I think it's realistic. And I think it makes sense. Thank, Thank you. you for that feedback. Um, I'd like to call on Carol next. Carol, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I I vote. I said I was somewhat opposed, and I, I'm mostly in favor. Um, what I'd like to see you do, though, is move number five to number one and number one to number two. Um, yeah. I think if the, the farmers are already struggling, and I believe they take second fiddle to the assistance from the county. Um, and I would like to, I haven't had an opportunity, I have no particular way of knowing how much input you've gotten from farmers. For instance, when you're talking about the, uh, the, the service areas in such places as Lisbon, whether you've looked at that from the standpoint of what farmers need to have there versus what the rest of the county needs to have there or the population, income and population wants to have. So that, that's the, my really only objection to that is based on how much the farmers are represented. Understood. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's been interesting. I've, I've had a good time. Actually, we um, actually had a, a consultant team member specifically focused on agricultural issues and opportunities. Uh, ACDS Phil Gottwall um, was on our team and he taught me so much. <laughs> frankly, um, I've got appreciation and history with farming as well. But man, what he knows, nobody can compare to at least for me. Uh, we did have a focus group where we've tried to speak and we've had some representation on our planning advisory committee with those issues, but, um, you know, you just bringing them up just brings them continues to keep them at the top of our mind. So I do appreciate it. Thank you. We'd like to call on Lori Liskin next. Uh, okay, can am I unmuted? You are. Okay, I am. Um, I'm feeling a little frustrated. Okay. It seems that the considerations that are now being talked about for the West have not been talked about for the rest of the county. And there has been an enormous amount of growth 
and there is continuing to be growth without taking into consideration the roads. For example, 108 is getting more and more crowded. Montgomery Road, there's going to, there's a huge amount of building going on right across from the shopping center and the traffic there is already congested. So I'm, I'm feeling like the West is getting some special uh, consideration. That said, I'm all in favor of um, helping the farmers, but I really do agree with the first speaker, Frank, that we have a situation now where there, it has happened, it has been allowed for all of these incredibly expensive homes to be built which will change the character of the county because a lot of people, current farmers, for example, could never afford to buy $800,000 homes. So if we're gonna build, and I think we should, because we have to be fair about this, we really have to look very carefully at having homes that are affordable for people who, you know, certainly less than starting in the high 500s or so on, which is what I see when I drive down that road. Um, so that that's it. Good comments. Thank you. All right. Um, we have a couple more minutes. Ted, would you like to uh, offer your comments? Ted Cochran? I was somewhat, oppo I was somewhat opposed. And uh, my rationale is that I, I, I like one, two, and five. I don't think that um, allowing more housing in Western Howard County makes a lot of sense given the transportation issues and so forth. And it would be more economical, and the houses would probably be less expensive if they were built out east where there would be uh, better access to transportation and that sort of thing. So, um, not real big on sprawling out into the West with more little village centers and things like that being built. Thank you. Thank you. I've got two more folks uh, up next. I'd like to take Tyler Bomer. Hi, thanks. Um, actually, I just kind of want to echo the, the previous comments. Um, it, it doesn't, like you had mentioned earlier, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of bang for the buck trying to expand out west. I think where I'm more concerned is the shared septic technology. Um, you know, there's a couple things there, but I think the biggest one is, you know, how big of an area would it be able to serve and really drilling into the cost details and, and what the replacement schedule looks like. Um, I, I have a friend who had to get off of a community septic and it was an absolute mess um, and it, it got very expensive. And so I just worry about how that, you know, operates down in the future. And and like you said, who who owns it? That can get very sticky. And you know, if people are mistreating a septic system, who's paying for that cost? Um, so I think that can get very, uh, you know, sticky in that in that regard. Um, so that that's my primary concern. Oh, sorry. Also, one just one other thing. Um, I think it would be really helpful if you if there was a breakdown on what housing is available out in the West because you know some roads I drive down yeah I do see a lot of expensive houses but I don't drive around all Western Howe County I don't I don't have a good idea of what are the houses that are available out there and do we actually need to start filling in in certain gaps. Mm -hmm. Good question. We. We have some data. I'd have to go back and look at it, frankly, just because you know there's so many numbers to keep in your head. Um, but we have been trying to to put our arms around that, so we do have some information we can uncover for you. Thank you very much. And I have Wanda Prather with her hand up as well. Yes, uh, I put that I somewhat support because these actually sound like good goals in that we need the missing middle. Uh, choice. We need the, a lot of the missing middle housing, and I think I would concur that number five needs to move up higher. But the main reason I'm not all in is the is number two says maintain the PSA boundary with two modifications. Um, I know what the HCPSS site looks like, but I'm not really sure how large a thing we're talking about with Maple Lawn West. I mean, are we talking about putting something the size of Reston out there or just a 20% increase in Maple Lawn. I don't, I don't know exactly how much development we're talking about there. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, as it's drawn right now, it's, I want to say it's three, 
parcels, but it might be four. I'd have to go back and look at where the boundaries are drawn, but um, it's basically moving west towards, help me staff, it's a turkey farm, is that the correct reference? So yeah. it's basically moving into the turkey farm area um, is what is being discussed right now, or the oh. idea that's been raised. Okay, the, oh, that's relatively small, that's, yeah, okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, I'm recognizing Paul wanted to make a comment. Paul, um, we're, we've run out of time on this first question, but I'm sure we're going to have more commentary to come. So I will call on you in the next uh, section that you've got a comment for us. Okay. At this point, I'd like to move on to the next Q&A. Sure. Thank you, Brian. So the second topic that we want to have some discussion about our activity centers. Um, and if you go to the next slide here, you'll see that, um, again, not a new idea, um, but one that's been talked about a lot within our planning process as well. We go back to the growth choices workshop and 65% of the respondents. So, you know, in those 1600 comments that we got and the, the hundreds of people, um, there were a lot of support for activity centers, but, you know, not a blank check, you know, on what terms and what grounds and how do you do it? And you can see, I don't want to hide that 23% of the people weren't sure at that time, that early in the process. So we had to do our homework and try to figure out what is an activity center, what does it need to achieve and the like. There was very strong support though in the gateway area. Uh, a lot of people recognize that as a place that could become an activity center in the future. And so we looked at that as well. And so when we got into activity centers, we looked into four topics here. Uh, the idea about making the activity centers walkable places and mixing uses, so residential and non-residential uses. What, what are the challenges and opportunities with that? The fact that nearly all of them are redevelopment opportunities, which is something much different to do uh, than doing something in a greenfield setting. Um, so there's a lot more um, steps and, and things to think about with redevelopment. The fact that redevelopment doesn't just mean more growth or more development, but it can also be our chance to restore and think green as well. So how do we replace pavement with impervious surface, for example? And then again, I go back to those housing options. We talked about them in the West. They're also important in the East. And so again, this is just pulling off of the future land use map from earlier, the areas that we're looking at or contemplating for activity centers. And we've got five of them. We have downtown Columbia, which matches the boundaries of the master plan. We have gateway, which you see called a regional activity center, just near the 95 symbol. We have three transit activity centers, which um, correspond to the stations for the Mark Camden line uh, between Boston and Washington. We have village centers that correspond to the historic village centers of Columbia. And then we have mixed use centers, which is the most widespread condition and a lot of times they represent opportunities where maybe you're in an aging shopping center or an office park or something like that. And is there an opportunity to do some infill um, in those areas? We did modeling in order to kind of figure out, you know, how much of what and where. Uh, we also reviewed previous plans and studies and different ordinances that were in place. And again, this is where we spent a lot of time with our planning advisory committee through the summer months trying to develop this map. So again, sometimes it's the picture that's more effective. So on the right hand side, you see that's the, the same shape of gateway and you know the idea about how you have a comprehensive and connected green space. Um, you also, you won't notice it on the bottom right without me telling you, but uh, we've drawn like a school in the gateway and parks in the gateway so that if that were to develop, how do you offset impacts within the site? Uh, the mixed use activity centers that you see in the middle, that's the idea of if you have these aging shopping centers that are in decline, how do you uh, reimagine them going forward? Um, and then again, you see the boundary for downtown Columbia all the way on the left of the slide. And with this again, one of our goals, we go back to the challenge was to be more predictable and more specific. And so on the left hand side, you see the plan Howard 2030 map. And it's growth and revitalization areas a little bit all over the place that the darkest color that pinkish color on the map. On the Hoko by design version, we're trying to be even more specific and it's more predictable on the land use side. So, you know, what's coming, but it also allows you to hone in uh, infrastructure improvements. If you're going to put in walking or biking infrastructure, you need to be targeted with the limited dollars you have and make sure it's being used 
where the development needs it most. We also, again, we had our transportation consultant involved and we're, we're really trying to look at this connection between land use density and, and transit viability. Um, and so we looked at several different corridors and as, as you see the, on the map, the darker the color, the more people, whether it's residents or employees are in that area. And transit is always most viable and the darker the color um, because it's the more potential riders that you might have. And so we looked at several different corridors to try to make sure we matched up land use decisions with where transit investments might be made in the future. So again, here we had six ideas that have kind of emerged. As soon as I'm done speaking, we open the poll, there'll be 45 seconds to answer the same question. Same question with the same responses, just a different topic. And then we'll call on you for discussion. I'll read them quickly. Number one is to develop five different character area categories that will address the specific needs of planned activity centers for the county. So we're, we're, we have a lot of categories here because we think there's, there's some unique needs and conditions in different areas of the East. Treat redevelopment of activity centers as an opportunity to reduce impervious surface, increase open space, and provide stormwater management where none existed before because rules and policies weren't in place sometimes when they developed. Number three, emphasize housing choices in the various activity centers that focus on affordable and attainable options for people of low to middle income categories. Provide a mix of land use and development in intensities for each activity center that realistically support local walk and bike trips between nearby destinations and a sustainable transit system for longer trips. Include opportunities for small format retail, office and incubator space in an activity center as a means to help small businesses in Howard County. Number six, prepare a gateway master plan to describe desired mix of uses, open space, development, building heights, and the like. So that would be a master plan that occurs after the general plan has been adopted. There'd be a deep dive study to really get into the details on what's needed in the gateway area. I did see a question on impervious surface. So impervious surface is all the asphalt and concrete that's on the ground. So like say parking lots, streets, and the like. It's things that water, rainwater would hit and run off immediately. Um, and so this would be more where uh, it would be able to um, sink into the ground in a more natural uh, condition. All right, so if you want to show the answers and uh, Brian, if it's okay, let me answer Pamela's because it's a question, a definitional question first. Um, so I'm going to answer that while the answers are, oh, we had a problem with the poll. Let me, let me go ahead, uh, Pamela, I'm going to answer your question and for others, it says, can you say more about the character area categories um, and how they relate to and what they mean for activity centers? Good question. So. All of our character areas, think of them as like a, an expression of what types of land uses, how intense development might be or might not be, uh, what types of, um, how you might travel to them. It's like just creating the feeling of what it's like to be in that development. And so what ends up happening is when we look at downtown Columbia, Gateway, the transit oriented uh, stations along the Bark Line, the historic village centers in Columbia, and then some of these um, kind of, I'll call them the aging shopping centers or office complexes. There's not one solution for all of them, right? They all need to have a little different application or something done in order to really maximize what can be done there. 
or to take into account the unique conditions that need to be accounted for. And so that's why we have so many categories um, to represent these activity centers. But the direct answer is a character area is an intended outcome for either development or conservation for a specific area on the future land use map. And some of them happen to happen to go with activity centers. That's why I brought them up for here. All right. So it looks like we did have a little technical issue with our poll. So what I'd like to do is just jump right into the conversation and feel free to identify for us uh, whether you were on uh, in the strongly agree to the neutral to the strongly opposed end of the spectrum. Um, I see Wanda Prather still has her hand up. Uh, Wanda, is there a new comment for us? I I don't I don't think I did that, but I I was going to. I do have a comment. Um, okay. I would like to see. This is awesome. Um, but I would also like to see in here that if you're going to have these activity centers that focus on a, affordable housing for people to low and middle income, I would like to see that include, uh, recreation, like county rec centers, because so that the kids who live there have places to go besides just hanging out at a shopping center and having one of the county um, recreation buildings as part of these solves a lot of other problems. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a good suggestion and, and one we've been talking about in terms of just a connected and sort of widely accessible green infrastructure network. Um, so, yes, that's been stuff we've been looking at in this area and everywhere else, frankly. Thank you. Uh, can we take Ted Cochran next? I'm back. I just said I strongly agree that uh, there's the gateway in particular is kind of a big area of large parking lots and low rise office buildings and empty space that could be um thoroughly redeveloped and have housing at multiple levels of affordability and be right near uh transit and on the baltimore washington corridor so much of howard county's growth could occur there and in downtown columbia thank you very much um how about dana soar A community, we need uh, more affordable housing for people. You know, our come brackets. We're just we're woefully short, and thousands of households are getting squeezed. Uh, problems getting worse as rents and values rise. Um, so, I think we want to be an inclusive community, and we want to make sure that our our educators and our nursing assistants and our retail store managers and our restaurant managers and staff and so forth have some options to actually live where they are. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. How about Lori Liskin? Lori, would you like to share some thoughts? case, but um, I'm just wondering about how we're going to look at the environmental impact of what we're doing. And if we are doing new building, we'll be, we'll be, be trying to use solar power and other forms of sustainable energy. We haven't really mentioned that at all. Unless I was 10 minutes late, I apologize. You may have mentioned it before I got on. No, it's actually a great question. And I'm, I'm not trying to open Pandora's box, but I'll tell you from a different event that we had somebody brought the idea they said well you know people are putting a solar farm out west look at all of the roof space that we have um, out east and why not also try to put solar panel and other things on those that we were even talking specifically about schools um so no it's a great comment and good timing um it's something we've been thinking about a little bit all right so next up i'd like to take 
Lisa Markowitz. Hello, thank you. Um, I uh, think it's a great idea to have more character area categories. Um, obviously, there's a lot of diverse types of um, areas in the county that can accommodate things more readily than others. Um, my concern, though, is that activity center infill targets are likely going to be in areas like Route 40 and Route 1, where the roads are not county roads and it's very hard and expensive to make those walkable. There's a big difference between having a planned community be walkable within it and then being able to get anywhere else. So, so that's a, um, an obstacle. Um, the concern also is that um, the difference between an intended versus a real outcome, um, the reality behind a lot of this would, would be a lot of focused density um, without really much affordable and um, crowding infrastructure and uh, concern that, that, the, that there might be too few preservation areas. Um, when you have a very focused high density target, um, you have to really look at schools. Um, I know people say that APFA will take care of that concern, but it really doesn't because APFA waits are uh, not much longer than the typical DPC process and then they just proceed. So we have to really um, balance these things. Thank you, Lisa. Caroline Bodziak. Um, Lisa actually brought up a couple um, items that I was going to mention. I am reading through everything and answering the polls under the assumption that APFA within Howard County, the adequate public facilities ordinance will be met with any development that occurs. And is that right? That that if they're going to build a new activity center near existing developments, the roads will be improved, um, and then uh, the other you know public facilities will be developed appropriately to manage the increase in population and increase in traffic, um, and also um she lisa mentioned schools and and i still have not seen schools you know in the considerations um but considering that most of howard county schools are woefully overcrowded already um that i think any development plan m must have a a serious focus on purchasing new properties or having a plan for redeveloping old properties um, to provide classrooms for all the incoming students. Yeah, hey, lots of good points. I'll tell you what, stay tuned for the last topic here. A lot of those are addressed in there. I think it's great that you brought them up now. We've got enough time for a couple more comments here. How about Kathy Hudson? Thank you. Uh, I like number five. That's a new one for me um, that I haven't heard before. And uh, I, I think emphasis on small businesses and places for them to, to set up shop would, would be really good. Um, I have not seen any studies on the Camden line where a lot of the activity centers and transportation and TODs is predicated on the fact that the Camden line is going to be this wonderful train um, access north and south. Um, it's not what I see, and I'd like to see that any studies for its future capabilities be part of this plan. Um, I still don't see an answer, Matt, to what are we going to do different along Route 1 that we're going to allow activity centers to now be successful when they've been an utter failure. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm still waiting for that answer. Um, I know, I know. I'm still working on it. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> I'd like to see a little more emphasis on public spaces, especially along Route 1 and Route 40. Um, it was mentioned by an earlier speaker uh, as far as community centers. We're still waiting for one in Elkridge. The kids don't have places to play. Um, you know, there's not public spaces. You know, the, the shopping centers forbid them. Um, you know, that's woefully inadequate. Um, 
and then the character areas, I, I know there's a historical community character area, and right. please make sure that there's a recognition that Lawyers Hill is a residential character area, not a commercial, as opposed to the other ones that do have commercial aspects to them. I literally worked on that this afternoon. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you very much. I'd like to call on Naomi next. Naomi, are you there? Not getting any audio from Naomi. Why don't we do this? Can I call on Stephanie Mummert? And Naomi, if you can text in the text box, just enter your comment and we'll share that for everybody. Hi, I'm Stephanie. Um, I, I think this is a, a, a great possibility presented in these options. I voted somewhat support because I'm not sure how realistic all of it is. Um, and my concerns about all of them are, um, people have already mentioned a lot of it, but my concerns are really the infrastructure and particularly roads because the gateway master plan, we I was at a previous um, uh, panel where we talked about the gateway. I think it's a great idea, but I live near gateway and the roads need to be changed dramatically to make it possible to make gateway work the most efficiently to meet its potential without clogging the, the neighborhoods around it um but i really in particular i really like somebody else mentioned this as well i really, really like number five because the idea of incubator spaces is i work in the biotech field and it's completely it's a, a a wonderful opportunity for biotech companies to use incubator spaces but it could be used in so so many other other areas um for economic development so i think that's a great idea Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All right, with that, I think we're going to move on to our next question. Naomi, I will look out for your comment and share that as soon as we get it. Okay, so uh, topic number three is different in uh, new and different housing options. And there was no shortage of comments. I mean, we're coming right off of the Housing Opportunities Master Plan Um as our process was kind of getting up and running and we agreed to really look at some of that in the scenarios. Um, and so a lot of uh, topics and a lot of um, opinions about housing throughout the county. And so you talk about, you know, a lot of things we've even raised already today about the cost of housing, the types of housing. Um, maybe we haven't talked yet about the fact that there are a lot of needs for senior housing and what type of a house um, uh, best meets those needs. Uh, the idea about the western part of the county and, you know, the fact that maybe accessory dwelling units, which I'll talk about here in a minute, um, are something that there's some interest in out there. Uh, and then this whole idea of don't just react to the number of units or what type of house it is, but how can we design it in a way that it is acceptable to the community and makes sense within the context of a neighborhood? So we'll show you a couple of examples here we, of what we looked at first. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we were really in tune with the housing opportunities master plans. Like I said, it was hot off the presses as we were doing our work. Um, we looked at this concept of missing middle housing, and I'll go into what that is in a little bit more detail here. Um, and then the viability of accessory dwelling units. Um, and so those were three topics we looked at because, you know, the housing opportunity master plan did so much on the broad perspective of housing. Um, we really wanted to focus on this. Uh, what is missing middle and then the accessory dwelling units. So there's really two applications or opportunities to think about. Uh, go back one just for a minute. Um, is one is, believe it or not, there are a lot of properties within neighborhoods today that when they were originally platted, they were very large lots. And now that water and sewer and things have come online and the way the zoning is written right now, without any... Um, uh, decision to be made um, for like leniency or variance or something of that nature, um, these lots can be divided again and you could build the same type of home right next door to where that home is now. Now it's not everywhere, but there are some places within the county that that can't happen. There are also some other places with a couple of just larger lots left. And so one 
option or opportunity for what's called missing middle housing, if you now click forward, uh, Victoria, please, is this idea of do you want to do infill missing middle housing? And so what you see here is, an, is a theoretical application of how you would infill this missing middle housing. And so by definition, missing middle housing means either two units together, three units together, four units together. And you can actually see in, in sort of the bottom left of that, that's actually a townhouse um, that could be in there or could not, you know, all depends. But if it were to go in there, um, how do you design it so it looks like the rest of the neighborhood? So you see, for example, all of the roof styles are the same as what's on the, the surrounding area. The landscaping tries to complement what's in the other area. Um, and the, the height of the buildings and those kind of things all try to work um, with the surrounding context. So one opportunity is to do missing middle housing in some of those areas in existing neighborhoods. The next slide shows you a different option. We've talked about these activity centers and in the activity centers, we talk about the fact that they'd be residential and non-residential. And so this is actually an example. Some of you are probably tired of me showing it by now, but this is an activity center near where I live uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it's got a mix of um, different housing types. It's got some retail and office. And if you just key on that large building here, as we go to the next slide, you'll see the actual built example. This activity center is already built. You'll see in the bottom right picture that same office building. That's the built version of it. And so it has this that small scale retail that's leading on that road in the bottom right corner. But more importantly, you see on the left hand side that there are some townhomes and other missing middle type homes that are created and are literally integrated right into the area, into the development. So it's not just on the side or the leftover property or something like that, but it's actually integrated in. You see in the bottom left, they actually use townhomes to hide the parking garage. And then the Whole Foods that you see in the top right is literally about 100 to 200 feet from the townhomes that you see on your left. So that's how quickly these things can transition in an activity center because of the way they're designed and they're meant to be mix of uses and kind of all integrated together. So that's another option for missing middle housing. And then we talked about this concept called accessory dwelling units, ADUs. And in Howard County today, you can have an accessory dwelling unit, but it has to be inside the principal structure, usually as a basement or an attic. The ideas that people have been talking about during our planning process are the detached versions of accessory dwelling units. So you can see photos here um, just taken from around the country where they're smaller format. They're usually designed to complement the primary building. So same style and architecture. A lot of times they're tucked behind or in a way that you don't see them readily from the street. In the top left corner, you see where the, gar the garage and the unit is above the garage. Um, so there are lots of different options for accessory dwelling units, and we're still working through kind of what's the definition and best examples to include in the document. So for this missing middle housing idea, and I'd be ris remiss not to mention that we had a strategic advisory group reminding you from earlier who helped generate a lot of thoughts and ideas uh, with us on missing middle housing. And so we have these five things that are just kind of emerging as we write the document. Number one, allow accessory dwelling units by right in specific character areas, which will be implemented by revisions to the zoning ordinance or land development regulations after adoption of the general plan. So remember, character areas are specific uh, types of development that have been programmed around the county in that future land use map. You would allow accessory dwelling units in some of those. Number two, target activity centers as the most promising opportunity to increase missing middle housing options in Howard County. We talked about the fact that we've got the neighborhood option, um, but you know that's more surgical and, and may or may not happen in, to a significant degree. Are the activity centers really a place we need to emphasize these housing choices? Number three, establish design requirements, publish pattern books or adopt form-based code provisions for missing middle housing that ensure new construction is consistent with the character surrounding neighborhoods. Now, basically, this is all about things that happen after the general plan. And these are those specific rules I talked about when I had my tulip field versus the tulip leaf petal. Um, and when you're here about a pattern book, 
that's where you actually have a book of pictures and drawings and things that say, this is what we intend things to look like in this neighborhood. Number four, establish various targets, criteria, and expectations in the general plan for missing middle housing concepts, including but not limited to where are the preferred locations for missing middle housing, what unit types are, are most uh, preferred under that broad name, and what design controls might be appropriate that would be picked up in the zoning ordinance or other implementing tools. And then number five, explore potential financial incentives, whether it's tax programs, grants, trust funds, something else um, that encourage missing middle housing throughout the county. One point to make here as we um, open this up for discussion, Brian, is we've gotten this question several times through our process. Missing middle housing is a type of housing. It's a format of housing, as I've been giving the examples today. How affordable it is, is a second question that goes with it. Because as you all know, I can show you uh, a duplex or a townhome around the country that it's a million dollars for that townhome, right? So how they become affordable and attainable is like part two of how we have this missing middle conversation. The missing middle is a format of homes. The belief is when they're smaller format sized homes, they can be more affordable. But then how do you actually continue that conversation or that thread to ensure that they're affordable that's additional policies that go beyond just colors on a map and things like that. So, Brian, let me just uh, hand it over to you. All right. So, <clears throat> again, in lieu of our survey here, um, I'm going to call on a couple folks. I just just a housekeeping item. If you raised your hand previously and I've called on you and you no longer need to make a comment, you can take that hand down. Thank you very much. Um, and if you'd like to raise your hand to be called upon, please do so now. Um, I'd like to just recap a couple comments from the prior section that we heard. Uh, one was from Naomi. Uh, Naomi was talking about uh, redevelopment of existing cultural and performing arts centers. And she said there are more outdoor spaces, uh, say at Meriwether, but existing enclosed areas like Jim Rouse Theater are out of date with access tied to the school district. Rouse cannot support the need for large performing arts groups like Columbia Orchestra with about 80 to 90 members. The new cultural center is very focused on specs that would address needs for Toby's Dinner Theater, but that space would not support other non-theater groups. So I just wanted to put that out there since we we're having technical difficulty uh, with Naomi's um, audio. Um, also, we had a comment from Frank and Frank's comment earlier was uh, was very supportive, uh, Frank said, of the intensive development in Gateway. Uh, and the main question and concern is how Gateway Master Plan will be developed and synchronized with the overall HOCO plan. And I can say that the Gateway Master Plan process would occur after uh, the HOCO by design process is complete. Um, and that would be, a, you know, a, probably a year or more of master planning work with all of the stakeholders at the community level um, to really inform the kind of um, type of growth that would occur there. Um, all right, I'm seeing Lisa Markowitz's hand up. Lisa, would you like to speak? Hello, thank you, sure. Um, uh, <coughs> something that stuck out to me with missing middle conversations, at least money-wise um, versus unit type, uh, it sounds like a lack of modern income housing units and a, a big argument in civic circles is that we should raise the fees paid not to provide them, which would give us a lot more of them and spread them out. I think that would be more productive than infill retrofitting things, which would likely focus density into neighborhoods without infrastructure. And it would also incentivize absent investment landlords. I'd rather see more inclusive mixes of types of, of, of structures in, in planned housing um, versus trying to fit them in uh, to existing neighborhoods where, like I said, you'd end up with investment purchases there um, and would really change character of things quite a bit. Um, one of the things that, that I am greatly concerned about with trying to provide more affordable housing um, across several different income levels, of course, is that um, the we we should be focusing on the county 
in the county with creating more direct supply of it. Um, such as land trusts that that other jurisdictions use where uh, the government buys up parcels, especially where redevelopment is really needed on blighted areas. And, and then they retain the ownership of the land and then people buy and can create some wealth, but they don't own the land. And, you know, some of these, um, some of these interesting ways of doing these direct supply of affordable housing, it, it creates permanent units because what, what we're doing now is we're, we're relying on high density to get small amounts of affordable and they're not even permanently affordable. And, and then the, the lower income projects we have, you know, they're more difficult to spread out and harder to do with all of the financing needs. But I, I'm talking about moderate uh, here for the most part that are, that are um, expected to just come from high density. Um, as far as the ADUs, um, there, there is that concern there about the owner occupied issue. Uh, one of the things I've I've seen as a concern about owner occupied requirement is that there's not as financial of a ability to do them, and so there wouldn't be very many of them. Um, and I don't think that that makes a lot of sense because you know when you have a a home and what it's worth and what your mortgage is and whether you can take a loan out and make an ADU, it may be a a big business that's going to to come into a neighborhood and buy up a bunch of houses and do that might have more financial wherewithal to do more of them. But I would think that a parcel, a homeowner would be able to do that or not do that. And maybe some of this financial incentive idea could go toward that goal to keep that uh, prospect owner occupied. So the, those are some of my concerns on this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. I'd like to call on Paul Verchinsky next. Paul? Uh, yes, good evening all. Um, I would like to point out a little bit of data. Uh, mm -hmm. This whole push for higher density in Howard County is predicated on we need population growth. If you look at the revenues that come to the county, they're from two sources. One property taxes, the other one the piggyback income tax. Yet the 2020 census, which just came out, said Frederick County had the highest population growth. And Howard County had the second highest population growth. So why are we pushing more density when we don't need it? We're getting the population growth without higher densities. We've been doing this for the last decade. So, you know, I, I have some personal problems with the higher density. And if you looked at the scenarios that people were surveyed on early on, they were looking at scenarios A and B. They were not looking at scenarios C and D. I agree that various areas do need to be rede redeveloped. But as to the densities, I think that that's a totally open question based on what I've seen. And it's basically a function that we should be looking at of can we support the schools or are we going to wind up decimating them? Because that is the major issue. We already have, as Lisa has pointed out and others, we have overcrowded schools we've got 240 trailers out there that have not been replaced by actual schools so you know you can do all of this but without the infrastructure you're going to wind up taking away the crown jewel of howard county and that's its school system thank you thank you all all right Next up, Carol. Carol Zervis. Hi. We have a situation which might serve and uh, that it's affecting our community right now, which might prove instructive in some way. Um, we have a two acre parcel that sits right smack in the middle 
of a, uh, it's surrounded on three sides by our 50 plus community. And it would be a great space to add some, um, some mod uh, modest income housing in there, um, 15 units probably, between 12 and 15 units. It's been grabbed up by a developer who wants to use it for commercial space. And it's zoned B1. So really it would be extremely difficult for us at this point to do anything about it. My question to take it out of our, our one specific neighborhood is, what if a neighborhood wants to create that accessory housing? What if it's not a developer who shows up and say, okay, let me develop that piece, that piece, and that piece. What road can a neighborhood take to, to begin to institute change itself? And how do you get through the HOCO government, I'm sorry, is very fragmented. To know what part of it to touch is tough. Appreciate that. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, um, you know, there are some really interesting examples around the country about, you know, um, either nonprofits or things that form in order to do that. And sometimes you just have to secure the land. And after that, you go find a developer. You don't have to do everything. Uh, but there are some interesting examples out there. Um, it usually takes some money. It takes some good organization um, and the like. But, you know, it's not impossible to do it, but um, you just got to get organized. Next, I'd like to call on Frank Hecker. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I had a couple comments real quick. Um, first on accessory dwelling units. Um, I agree as a matter of general principle that people should be allowed to build AUs in areas where there's room for them and, you know, the, the, they own the property and so on. I guess my major concern there, especially by putting them first in the list, is when I looked at some of the material, I seem to recall that there are only like about maybe 100 possible uh, ADU opportunities within the entire county that were called out. And, and that seems like a, a not very many units for the to make the, you know, to make the number one priority of this particular um, section. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but that was, that was just the number I remember. Um, the other thing in, in terms of, I agree with, uh, although for different reasons, I agree with Lisa Markowitz about both focusing middle, miss, missing middle housing on activity centers as opposed to neighborhood infield. Um, I just think the political opposition you're gonna get from trying to do infill development in existing neighborhoods is so great. It just makes a lot more sense to focus efforts on the activity centers where there's already a commercial component. And I think the, the opposition is gonna be relatively less. Mm -hmm. So that's my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, Naomi shared a comment in the chat box. Um, Regarding affordable housing, I'd like to see more affordable options for aging seniors who want to age in place. We don't need more retirement centers. Some seniors want to stay in their home or move to another place that is suitable for seniors, such as a smaller square footage, uh, few or no stairs, single story housing. And Clara, Clara, could you provide some context for your comment as well? Yes, I, on your sketch with the infill and also some of the other sketches that you've shown of redevelopment, mm -hmm. you're adding capacity for more households, but you, I'm not, it's not clear you're adding adequate parking. So you're saying this is not an opportunity to reduce the hardcover pavement, but I don't see where you're putting the cars. Sure, it's a good point. Um, In current life, we, we're, a household may need three cars. Or may, or may need four cars and planning for one or two is no longer adequate in our modern world. <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah, I don't disagree with that with the current size homes you have. Hopefully with some of the missing middle, smaller formats, you may get away. Um, it's interesting. Now, don't I don't want you to think this is what I was advocating when that was drawn, but I literally before this meeting was just catching up on some of the stuff going on in our part of the world and they just approved a no car apartment complex in Seaverville, North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, 140 units, six parking spaces. 
And they, as part of the lease, you have to sign that you will not own a car. I mean, there's just all kinds of things going on right now. It's interesting. Claire, if we really went in and did a, a, a site plan, like for a very specific place, we would have uh, service drives and those kind of things to make it, to park it. Um, it. It was just a concept, but yet your point's taken uh, on adequate parking. All right, with that, let's move on to our next chapter. Sure. All right, so topic number four was on the environment. Um, and again, we had a strategic advisory group that was formed on this, but there was no shortage of comments really in any of the engagement activities we've had so far. Um, people brought up climate change and the fact of the um, uh, climate action plan that the uh, county supports. And so you better you know, implement that as part of your general plan. Um, some people thought that, you know, going uh, to higher density is green because if you have smaller footprints and taller buildings, as long as you make the area that you don't take up with a building footprint green again, there is kind of a trade off that you can look at from a design perspective. Um, I thought it was really interesting and I, I took this one to heart in the lower left. You know, people talk about schools and roads and public safety and the like, and then the environment was like in a different category and they said, no, 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 the environment is an infrastructure, just like any other infrastructure, you know, the stormwater management, nobody does it better than mother nature, those kind of things. So, you know, it really kind of got my head right when I started to think about the environment as another infrastructure category. And then we did hear though, if you see on the bottom, right, where they were talking about, you know, all these new ideas and things you have do add cost to do development. And it's okay if you're doing a cost for a market rate home, but if you are trying to meet affordable housing goals and the like, we may need to look for partners or ideas on how to manage some of the costs of development so they can remain affordable. And for this topic, it really comes down to two maps. These are the two maps we've really been working with through our process. <clears throat> on the left-hand side, if you haven't seen it before, it's called the Green Infrastructure Network. And it's a map and a, and a plan that's been done several years ago, and it identified um, critical habitats and uh, ecological health of the county and how it's connected. And so we've looked at that and overlaid with where places are preserved or where there's development that could happen in the future and looked at the conflict of these two things so we can try to address them in the general plan. The other thing on the right is our watersheds map. Um, and, you know, watersheds, you know, don't know political boundary, right? They're, they're based on ridge lines and falls. And a lot of the recommendations that have been talked about for the environment would maybe be better served if you tied them to different watersheds versus some other uh, planning jurisdiction or something that we might have. And so we've been thinking about that as well. Lots of stuff that we looked at with uh, from the environmental lens. We looked at the natural resources within the county. We thought about climate change um, and especially what's been going on recently. Uh, talked about the equitable access to nature. Um, you know, does everybody truly have access in the county to everything that uh, people cherish and desire um, within the boundaries? We spent a lot of time looking at, at uh, funding for environmental programs, you know, there's a lot, there's been a long history of planning for the environment, but how do you start to fund some of those things now? Um, watershed based approach to the natural resource management, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and again, that would be where you organize your rules and policies and requirements using the boundary of the watersheds that we had on that map, rather than the boundary of Columbia or the boundary of the rural West or the planned service area boundary. It'd be another set of boundaries that's more appropriate to the needs of the environment and those rules and policies. Uh, measure and enhance resource protection and restoration with new development and redevelopment. So again, if you are gonna do redevelopment, it doesn't all, every inch does not have to be developed. How do we green up these areas as well? And then implementation of the green infrastructure network plan, again, which is available through the Howard County website, um, or if you contact us through our project website, we can get it for you as well. But really looking at and layering that on to try to see where the opportunities are uh, within the general plan. So six ideas came up here, um, and uh, I should have mentioned earlier, I apologize, but these are in no particular order except the, the order that I put them on a slide. 
Um, but it doesn't mean number one is the highest ranking or anything like that. I just want to make, be clear on that. Uh, but there were six ideas that came up here. One, measure to protect and restore the county's ecological health will help address climate change mitigation and adaptation. Number two, protecting and restoring the county's ecological health should be considered when updating county programs and policies and where possible integrate as a component. So there's, there's been some conversations about how the environmental conversation has a lot of passion and support, but it's in a silo. How do we make sure it kind of works its way into all the different uh, rule uh, responsibilities and services the county provides or the decisions it makes on development or conservation? Number three, ins ensure programs and measures to protect and restore the county's e ecological health are adequately funded. And we looked at the agriculture land preservation program as one model for maybe creating something to do land acquisition of environmentally sensitive areas. Um, it's been wildly successful in the Ag Pres program. How do we replicate that for environmental stewardship? Number four, expand watershed based approach for natural resource management, address the need for enhanced stormwater management due to climate change and vulnerable watersheds. A lot of the areas that developed in Howard County developed before there were stormwater regulations. And so there's a lot of flooding that goes on because it wasn't taken into account in the original time it was developed. Number five, build on recent accomplishments to strengthen the Forest Conservation Act and environmental waiver process by reviewing other regulations for additional opportunities to protect sensitive environmental resources. And then number six, expand the implementation of the Green Infrastructure Network Plan by integrating it into other county plans and programs. So, Brian, do we have hands up already or call to action? All right, so third verse, same as the first. Um, if you had your hand up, but you didn't need to comment any further, please put your hand down. If you'd like to raise your hand for comment, please raise it now. And if you're not able to communicate, uh, please put your comment in the text box and we'll either call on you or read it out. Uh, so the first person I've got is Kathy Hudson. Thank you. I'm still muted. No, we got you. We got I can you. hear you. Go ahead, Kathy. <laughs> we're, we're muting and unmuting ourselves here. Okay, I say mute. Can you hear me? You're good. Okay. You're good. Thank you. Um, I think we also need to add uh, health as well into this. Um, when we were talking about the, the, the ecological health, also personal health, um, we're putting the density in areas where um, particulate matter is pretty high. Um, if you're looking at expanding gateway, that is a major now um, air, fl air flight pathway for next gen. So you have the noise and particulate matter there. So we have environmental justice issues if you're putting low and moderate income housing there. And it just, that all needs to be taken into consideration. Um, Howard County does not have any air monitoring control um, devices. Um, so we really, we don't know how bad it is, um, but you've got all the highways and the trains and the um, airplanes flying around buzzing this area that, uh, you know, have an effect on on our health. And so I think that needs to be part of it. And especially as we start where we're putting our, our vulnerable populations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, how about Lisa Markowitz? Hello. Thank you for your thoughtful comments, Kathy Hudson. Um, I think that these six points here are, are very commendable, excellent, and very general. Um, the concerns will be in the details, of course, coming later, and these are these are blob colors, nowhere near tulips, obviously. <laughs> I want to I want to I want to stay speak on the density is green phrase. I think we have to be careful with that because that is only true when you limit to redevelopment that's being done on previously already existing impervious surfaces. Um, up is green only really applies to those scenarios. Um, when, when you take down woods in good condition, when you take down a lot of trees, you are not going to do a better job with even the current stormwater management. You're just not. Um, you, you will if you're replacing uh, impervious surface that, that 
didn't doesn't have the better better issues going for it now, like you said. Um, I think limiting info preserves land. I think high density zoning um, makes things very attractive to develop. I, I would love it if we could differentiate in zoning between whether a development is is redeveloping an impervious surface that exists or not, and and maybe have less densities allowed uh, on those areas because that's what incentivizes the buying up of that land and the clear cutting of land. Is if if I'm if I'm going to do a project that's allowing a lot of density, I'm going to make more profit on that parcel than not, and so you're incentivizing uh, to to buy and 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 cut down places more and when you know you say up is green and density is green um, I wish we could implement rules that really allow those things that incentivize that kind of development in in the areas where it can be handled in the infrastructure and also with environmental aspects of of not taking down so much of what we have left in our old established forests and trees. Thank you. Yeah, good comments. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> next comment, Frank Hecker. Yeah, I'm going to respond directly to what Lisa just said. Um, I, maybe I'm missing something, but I, I thought reading all the material you all had published that basically any development in the county from this point forward is going to be redevelopment. And so it's, uh, and maybe this is worth emphasizing, again, following on from Lisa's comments, maybe it's worth emphasizing that this is, that whatever plan you end proposing is not going to involve clear cutting the county, um, but it's going to be in, in, in the majority, it's going to basically be redevelopment of existing things where there's already buildings there, there's already impervious, impervious surfaces there, and the amount of forest clearing and so on like that is going to be relatively minimal given the, the amount of development that's going to go on. So anyway, that's that's just my that was my impression. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but that's my impression of, of what the situation is. No, Frank, I think you're correct at the at the broad scale or or the broad statements, but where, where I kind of took it. Um, and Lisa, with your comments was a couple of things. One is, you know, we do have the village centers that are in Columbia. And so, you know, the parkways and those kind of things, you know, obviously open space and green is so important to Columbia from its roots. Um, you know, how do you, when you talk about redevelopment, how do you make sure it's, that's why it's a little unique and maybe done a little differently. And then I've always kicked around an idea. I just have never brought it across the finish line of, you know, we have like this incentive or performance zoning and it's like, oh, if you do affordable housing, you get this many more units. Well, what if you took the amount of impervious surface and based on how much of it you reduced, you could get a density bonus or something like that? You know, like think of it in the inverse from the green perspective. That, those were the kind of things I was racking in my head, um, Lisa, when you were speaking from a redevelopment perspective. Thanks, Matt. Um, how about Wanda Prather? Thank you. Um, I I would like to see uh, a note in here somewhere that there will be standards in the redevelopment of the activity center for making that redevelopment green. That the buildings that are redeveloped um, have to meet some requirements or something. I don't. I don't see just letting people say, okay, you can redevelop this, take down the old village center and put up something else. Uh, like you said, there needs to be some something to make that those those buildings at least minimally, I wouldn't even say minimally, but I think there should be a hard look at, like you said, making them carbon neutral. Maybe not 100% carbon neutral, but at least some percent carbon neutral. And by that, I, I'm not. I mean anything, whether it's like you said, putting solar on the roof, um, uh, uh, placing 50% of the impervious surface with a rain garden, something like that, that you reduce the carbon footprint as you develop. I just don't. 
as you redevelop, I just don't see any justification for not doing that, given the climate crisis we're in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. And we did have a comment from Naomi in our text. It says, I'd like to see ideas on how the county can increase material recycling and reuse and encouraging companies to develop technologies and techniques for more efficient recycling and reuse. With that, we're going to wrap up this section and move on to our final section of uh, presentation. So this one's actually my favorite because as, as you all have kind of mentioned in your comments already, it, to me, we have a vision, we have a map that sort of implements that vision, but then this growth management is really about on what terms do you accept it, right? Um, and, you know, I've heard about in our conversations about just the catching up that needs to be done before you even talk about anything in the future, but there's a lot to be said, and I'm going to hopefully connect a lot of dots from throughout our evening's conversation. So in terms of what we heard, obviously high quality schools, you know, I can't go a meeting without hearing about that 10 times and it's awesome. I understand what a magnet and attractor that is. We heard a lot about, you know, adequate infrastructure being in place to be timed with development um, and the fact that you're behind in certain categories for sure. Um, and then are there any innovative ideas out there? Um, because as we talked about it, Given where you're at in your growth cycle, there's going to be new ways you have to think about growth and development and how they occur and when they occur in the future. So with that, we looked at several different things here. We looked at, uh, I'm sorry, next slide. So we looked at the amount of land that's actually left to develop or redevelop within Howard County. Uh, we looked at different growth projections compared to a market trend analysis that we did and the like. Here we'll talk a little bit about the gateway master plan and then again the adequate public facilities ordinance that was brought up earlier this evening. All right, so way back when and if you want to go on hoco by design.com on the physical assessments, there's a land use assessment. This is where the map comes from. But generally where all those orange specks are on the map, that's currently undeveloped land that is also unprotected land. Um, so it could develop in the future and it's about 2% of the land area and is generally scattered and relatively small. The largest of the orange spots you see is about 67 acres, but the average size is about five acres in those orange areas. We also tried to look at anticipated growth that we were planning for uh, as part of this planning process. Um, and what I will tell you is we looked at a 20 year horizon and actually the market trends analysis thinks that more growth um, would want to come here if you let it um, upwards of 30,000 dwelling units and upwards of 60,000 employees from a market perspective would really like to come here. Well, what does that mean? One, we don't think those numbers are realistic given where we're at in our planning process and I'll go over what that means in a minute. Number two, redevelopment takes a lot longer to occur than your suburban development you've been doing so far. You, Howard County is really good at suburban development, depending on your perspective of, of what's happened, but they're efficient at it now. Um, and then also the um, uh, gateway master plan that's going to be done. We can talk about that here in a few minutes. But generally speaking, we also broke out like the pace of development. And so I think as some people mentioning earlier, if you look at the number of dwelling units, you're about 1500 dwelling units per year that were being built in the previous 20 years, 2000 to 2020. And you had about 2400 new employees that would come in uh, each year over that same time period, 2000 to 2020. With the growth targets that we're looking at for HOCO by design, we're actually gonna be lower than what you were in the last 20 year planning period. And again, a lot of that, for the reasons I gave. Also, if you are going to redevelop some of these activity centers and the like, you heard Brian mention a gateway master plan could take another year. Then you have to get the zoning in place and stuff. So there's a little bit of a lag um, just in terms of if you want to grow, because you're going to have to grow differently uh, going forward. And then if you go to the next slide, it's, it's even more interesting when you break down what this growth, how this growth is made up. And so everything in the blue box you know, for lack of a better term, I say I inherited everything in the blue box because I'm the newcomer, I'm the outsider. 
were the hired consultant specifically for Hoco by design to be an extension of staff. And so these things in the blue box are kind of things that we inherited and had to plan for. So committed development are things that are already approved, but not yet coming out of the ground. Uh, and you can see there's over 7,000 dwelling units that are already on the books and about 1,400 more, more employees. The 2%, the undeveloped areas, if you take the zoning that's in place today, you can see another 2,000 units could build there and another 4,200 employees. Infill development, remember I was mentioning during the missing middle conversation that there were lots that were large enough that could be resubdivided. The actual potential, we did a study on this, is over 3,000 new lots could be realized through resubdivision potential. We're just recognizing the fact that, you know, that it's based on property owner interest. Um, there has been some done in the past. It hasn't been as widespread as you would think, um, but we're assuming that some of those may happen. Um, just out of simple economics and the like. So we throw those in there. And then downtown Columbia has an adopted master plan. And so we're carrying forward the numbers from that master plan of the units that have not yet been built. Regional center gateway, we're assuming no development in there right now because the master plan needs to answer that. Any number that we put in there may be too high, it might be too low. When the community can come together and really plan for what can go there, what its impacts to infrastructure are, the right development program, that's the best time to put the numbers in, which is a similar path that happened for downtown Columbia's master plan. You can see the focus, and Frank, this gets back to your point about the activity centers. Remember, so much of those are redevelopment. Those are the units and the employees that we think could be realized over a 20 year period um, if you're able to activate the, those centers. and. Kathy, to your comment, I got to figure out how to crack the nut too on, on kind of how the interest kind of amps up on these activity centers. Um, and then also, you know, what rules and things need to be in place even after the general plan is adopted. Somebody mentioned the accessory dwelling units. Again, we put 500 in there for right now. It's really just to recognize interest that we've been hearing about, but it's really going to be property owner driven and they're interest driven. And so we're just trying to look at what rules and regulations you would put in place. Um, and so, again, 23,000 dwelling units and 35,000 employees, over two thirds of that or more is really stuff that we're already planning for the decisions made before. And about a third of it is new stuff that was being contemplated with this general plan. Now, that doesn't erase the fact we have to prepare for all the infrastructure to accommodate all of it and the like, but it's just interesting to see the way these things break down a little bit. So then once you have a future land use map that implements a vision, and then once you have the numbers of what, what kind of growth might be coming, we immediately have to turn our idea to supporting infrastructure. And here's an example, you've already brought it up a couple of times this evening about transportation and the system. The facts of the matter, you know, if I don't sugarcoat it, is you only have 2% undeveloped land. It's hard to build new roads and new location. And it's also hard to widen some of these roads. And so when we're looking at what solutions might be out there, there's not the easy off the shelf ones that you might have if you were, you know, if this was 40 years ago, we're gonna have to make some hard, look at this uh, very critically and make hard decisions and try and figure out some really out of the box and innovative ways. So kind of stay tuned for that. Uh, but we are looking at transportation. If you go to the next slide though, we are really trying to look at moving people, not just automobiles with this approach. And we're really trying to link up land use and transportation, in this case, transit. And so you see different color lines are on the map, are different um, corridors that could be important for moving people from Howard County to within the region, but also connect people in, within the county. And so that you see there's a hierarchy of different types of corridors and what they might be planned for. A lot more of this coming in the document. But then those activity centers that we've been showing you, that's where these dots are in this map. So how do you plan the infrastructure to support the development decisions that you want to have? We're also looking at things from a parks and open space uh, mindset as well. And this is an interesting map. We took all of the current parks and shared facilities, school facilities that are in place. And on the Eastern side of the planned service area boundary, there's this initiative to, from Walk Howard and Bike Howard to try to connect people with these facilities and amenities, non-automobile. 
And so the, the dark gray circles are a quarter mile walking radius. The hatched are a half mile bicycle radius. And then you see the larger circles predominantly in the west, but some of the stuff on the borders, that's a one mile drive. And as you start to see where growth occurs, you start to see where you, you're lacking infrastructure, in this case for parks and open space, but you see big holes in the donut like gateway and like along the route one corridor and the like that if you're going to put the residential development, you need to put the green there to serve them. And then there was mention about schools and, and we've really been trying to work with this issue as well. I'll tell you from, a, from my perspective, not being from Howard County, there's been a very serious commitment to having this conversation for the general plan. A lot of places we deal with will just say that the school's issue is separate from the general plan and they don't really embrace it. There was a strategic advisory group that was formed for this. The general plan will not solve all the problems, but it's trying to have eyes wide open and a handout for partnership. And so this graphic has been used a lot for those of you who haven't seen it. The general plan is in the middle and the things that we're going to do at the general plan, it's recommendations, it's policies, the targets that we set, the future land use map has a direct correlation to school planning. But then even before we leave the county, the general plan can work with things like adequate public facilities, ordinances, as well as school reservation processes and the like to try to figure out how to better tune and time up growth development and available infrastructure. But then ultimately the school system has to work with us and the way they draw their attendance boundaries, some of their um, facility planning and funding and the like, as well as the way land banking and things go, it's gonna have to take both parties in order to realize what the goals are. And so if you go to the next slide, you can see, and some people were talking about this already, we really worked with our strategic advisory group to sort of think out of the box a little bit. And we looked at things like redeveloping aging shopping centers as school sites or changing the prototype of a school. Does it always need to have 40 acres? There's places around the country that have been wildly successful with different formats. Um, you know, how does the county work with the land reservation process while the school is trying to secure sites and identify sites? So from a an operation standpoint, how does that work? But there were lots of great ideas that were brought up that will um, be highlighted in the document. Some of them for the county to address in the general plan, others for the school system to take up later in the process. So with that, we have five ideas um, that are starting to emerge here as well. One is explore alternative models for the adequate public facilities ordinance that addresses the needs and demands for new infrastructure associated with redevelopment. And this is about transportation as well as schools. We didn't get into it because we could spend the whole hour on it, but the way the APFO is written right now was written for suburban subdivision development. And now with redevelopment or smaller pieces of property coming in, it's not, it's not achieving all of its objectives anymore. Uh, for which you all have already given some feedback on. Number two, conduct a thorough analysis of student impacts in Howard County, focusing on both new and existing turnover trends, really trying to get our arms around the demands for schools moving forward. Number three, establish population employment targets for Gateway through the master planning process, and then amend the general plan to include those project projections after the analysis is done. And so we can look at development potential, infrastructure impacts, and absorption rates. Number four, schedule updates to different master plans, policies, programs, and capital budgets for the different county departments so they implement the recommendations from the general plan. And then number five, start to think out of the box with the school system on ways that we can implement some of the ideas from the strategic advisory group, including exploring redevelopment of existing commercial sites for new schools, considering proffers or donations for land for new schools, or having developers just build new buildings right away or do additions to buildings right away. Or C, examine alternative school design models and, and best practices that either have smaller footprints. Some places we work in, they share facilities like a football field or something like that, or have modular design or are more vertical. Maybe they're three stories instead of one story. And again, a lot of that to be determined, but just identify that there are other ways to uh, solve the issues you have right now. All right. So again, if your hand was up previously, 
uh, if you can take it down, unless you have a new comment to add. Um, I do have Frank. Frank, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, so one is a one is just a um, a presentation issue. Um, all, all the reports that you have basically focus on absolute numbers, absolute number of new dwelling units, absolute number of new employees, and so on. I think it would be useful for some perspective if you if in the material you generate, you you also quote that stuff in terms of percentages. Mm -hmm. I mean, twenty three thousand new development units for a a county that had let's say. You know, 20,000 existing development units is a totally different proposition than 23,000 new dwelling units for a county that has, let's say, 100,000 plus, which I believe is the right. place for Howard. So right, that, right, right. I think it would lend some perspective to put that in percentage terms. The other thing is, as part of number four, I, I think it would, I, I don't know how much you want to go down this road, but I think it would be very useful to <coughs> propose that discussions be started on just general financing mechanisms for handling things like new infrastructure and other things. I think right now there's a tendency that people want to push that off on developers, which basically means pushing it off on the new people who will be moving to Howard County and basically spare the folks that are already living in Howard County and are benefiting from higher home prices and, you know, the ability to, to cash out on those homes when they when they retire and move elsewhere. So I, I'd like to see some discussion at least started as to uh, identifying funding mechanisms that are that will not only address the need for what the county's going to need in terms of new infrastructure and so on, new schools and so on, but also uh, provide some level of equity and doesn't disadvantage some uh, parts of the population versus other or disadvantage new residents versus existing residents. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, we had a clarifying question from Dana with regard to the, the ratios between new units and new employment and uh, the ratios as they relate to different um, areas of growth. Uh, I was just wondering if you could comment on the, the relative uh, ratio between the two. Sure. So, um, in theory, they almost are can be thought of in isolation in, in some ways. Um, the, the dwelling units are driven primarily by um, desirability for your schools and things of that nature. And so uh, actually, if you go to the market trends analysis, you'll see that it was 30,000 new dwelling units who would like to come here. The market analysis also found 20,000 more units, so 50,000 total that would love to be here if you let them. They call it the latent demand, which is going to the surrounding counties, but would like to come to your school system as an example. So that number actually is even much higher than what we've been looking at, um, but we've tried to be more realistic on it. On the job side, um, it's interesting because you're not in ice, you're in a region, right? So if we were in isolation, we'd be trying to look at the jobs, housing balance and how you know, you in order to get jobs, you have to have places they have to live and all those kind of things. In this regard, because you're 25 miles from Baltimore and 25 miles from Washington, D.C., um, it's all one big kind of ecosystem and the like. And so um, from the, whether it's the Spending Affordability Committee or other groups, there's an emphasis on or an acknowledgement about trying to bring in more jobs. Um, and so we're always trying to do that, but when you bring in the jobs, you need to try to bring in some households with it. Not so much because of absolute, but maybe more because of the type of worker and the thing that you're looking at as well. Um, so we're looking at it right now, you know, the, the ratio, like I said, is 23,000, um, homes and 50,000 ish jobs. So it's like 2 to 1, um, but. If we had more land, we would probably do, we try to bring even more employment in uh, as an example. What's also interesting here though, I can't remember who said it though, but they called it the, the piggyback income tax. It's really interesting in Maryland, most places in the country we work, the residential is always a loser. But in this case, um, having residential development actually does generate positive income when it's new growth um, on its, you know, the first round of what's coming in. Now, again, the expenses can unravel in a hurry, but it's really interesting kind of stuff. But 
generally speaking, in this case, a lot of the jobs in housing was dictated by the land available uh, at this time around. Thanks, Matt. Is it fair to say that the commercial redevelopment is going to create more jobs than residential redevelopment? Uh, so depending on where the where that redevelopment may be occurring, um, the ratio may be a little bit different. So there may be a higher ratio in certain areas of commercial redevelopment. Yes. Uh, for, for employment. Uh, yes, but again, it depends because all our activity centers are are targeted at residential and non-residential. So it really is case by case and site specific. Um, we had another comment from Ted generally about the um, biking and uh, um, vehicular uh, commute sheds, I think is what we were talking about, the, the bicycle and the car sheds. Um, Mac, could you talk about the methodology there? Ted's commenting 10-minute uh, drive equals about five miles, where 10-minute bike ride equals about two miles. Um, Ted, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? But I could speak for hours, but um, basically uh, my position would be that uh, density promotes biking and walking, and that reduces the transportation uh, congestion. The map that you showed of the bike sheds and the walking sheds, uh, they were way too small. So if you think about uh, 10 minutes as your um, you know your errand time or something like that. Ten minutes is five mile bike or five mile drive and a ten mile uh, five mile drive and a two mile bike ride, uh, and probably a half mile walk. You probably had that poster right. Um, so you should draw those circles bigger and then look at how um, tying the employment center to the housing can help with your transportation congestion. Yeah, Ted, I accept your I accept your points. Um, it's always different and it, it's, there's so many nuances to it, right? So um, for me, the 10 minute bike ride, the two miles is probably for the more experienced rider. But if you're the, if you're the parent with the two children, you're towing behind, uh, maybe you don't get two miles in 10 minutes. Um, so it all kind of depends how we wanna, how we wanna do this, right? So we, we chose, you know, one criteria and I understand that depending how we put meat on the bones of the definition of the user, uh, actually, to be honest, the best way to do this would be a trace back, right? So we actually trace back where bicycle facilities are because it wouldn't be a perfect circle, right? You know, it's more of an organic shape. Uh, but so, uh, you know, I've, I've seen the numbers you've used. I've, you know, the numbers we use are in publications around the country as well. So. It's just kind of whatever we want to decide to use as a group is what we can use. Appreciate the invitation to talk to you more offline on this, Ted. Thank you. Um, I've got two more people with their hands up. We are over time. Uh, so I just want to recognize that and thank everybody for bearing with us. Uh, I'd like to call on Lisa and then Stephanie, and then we're going to close out this section. Hi, thank you. Um, I am concerned about any advice that would weaken FO because as as we've seen from the, the growth analyses, uh, a high growth county that we are, it didn't, it hasn't stopped growth from occurring. Uh, the weights there are not much more than the regular expected DPZ process. I wish that fees in building uh, were regionally based so that they could be used as planning tools and one size fits all isn't really working. Uh, I don't believe that the fees in building can just be passed on in new home prices. The market pricing of housing doesn't work like that. So I do think that huge projects should have proffers, ray schools. Um, I really like the ideas of having some different thoughts about school capacity supply. Uh, we'll need equitable regional analysis there, of course. Um, I do want to say that demand can't just drive supply. Responsible planning has to figure out how much demand can be accommodated. If 8 million people wanted to live here, they couldn't, right? So, but obviously very much high demand exists. But that means by economic definition that higher supply is not going to mean lower prices. That, that's bandied about quite a bit. I don't think that's the case. And lastly, um, number two, the only concern I have with that language there is uh, where trends may not coexist as facts. 
uh, when we are an analyzing student impacts, we need to use facts because a lot of times you'll see forecasted trend uh, thoughts that are not accurate. Um, thank you. Thank you. Stephanie. Uh, unsurprisingly, Lisa actually covered exactly what I was concerned about as well. I, um, my concern was with the um, any mention of alternative models for APFO is please, 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 if you plan to replace it, don't replace it with something that's, um, you need something that's stronger and that supports the need for capacity in the schools, not something that's more permissive to development without school capacity. But having said that, I mean, and Lisa pretty much covered all of that. So um, I actually really like the ideas from the strategic advisory group um, about schools. And I actually found their report with the kind of big picture suggestions. And I think they, you know, they have really good suggestions, specifically the, um, the vertical development and all, everything in option B. I think they did a really nice job. So thanks. Just one point, just so everybody's aware. Um, the way the bill is written or the legislation is at the county, they have an APFO committee has to be convened within one year after this new general plan is adopted in order to bring the two together. So um, there's no getting around it. We're going to have to look at it. And the general plan we're hoping is to provide the guidance, you know, kind of the work program or the, the targets. Um, but then that committee is, is going to have to con come together to try to resolve that. Excellent. Okay. Uh, I'll let you finish it up, Matt. Sure. Just, and this is very quick. Um, thank you all very much. You know, every time I get to have a conversation with, with groups like you all, it just gives me a different perspective, better understanding, and, and it makes a better writer. I write with more confidence. So thank you for that. Um, as was mentioned, we do have a survey. Um, that will have questions similar to what you'd, you'd seen in the first issue. Um, and we're asking that if you can take that survey by 1159, and I guess it's, is that Sunday now the 19th? I keep forgetting now. Um, so Sunday, um, this coming Sunday, you would have till. And there are closed-ended questions, but there are open-ended questions. And I know if you're like me, I usually skip the open-ended ones. I'm trying to go very quick. But if you have some time, give us some thoughts in the open-ended boxes. You'll be amazed how many times phrases, ideas, ways you have to say something end up making it into our document because it's just like a light bulb moment for us. We're like, yes, that's the way to say it. So if you have the opportunity, fill in the missing the open boxes because that's honestly probably the most beneficial uh, feedback we can get at this time, given where we are in the process. I just want to reiterate, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, and so in terms of where we go from here, I always want to make sure you know where the finish line is. Um, as a consultant team, we're working in September uh, to write the full draft document. We're then going to be working with county staff in October to just review it, make sure we got it right. You know, <laughs> did we go too fast here? What needs to be changed so that we really make sure we honor the planning process? Then eventually that document will go out to the public um, in the fall. And then we'll schedule the meeting with planning board in order to have our work session with them and then go through the formal hearing process. The goal is to um, pre file with county council in the very beginning of January 2022 and then go through their hearing process in the early part of 2022. So stay tuned. There's a lot coming on right now. This is the best time to really stay engaged and involved. If you have a chance and you want to go on the HokoByDesign.com project site, if you haven't already, uh, register for the email blast. I promise we'll be sensitive to how many we send out, but really this is a, a great time to be part of our process. And with that, I will just say thank you and hope to see you all again soon. Thank you all. And this recording will be made available on the website so you can see all of your, uh, all of our faces again. Um, with that, really appreciate your time and let's go Ravens. It's almost kickoff time. Thank you all. <laughs>